Thank you, Iris. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the house of the Lord. Are you glad to be here this morning? Amen. Good to hear. And welcome to those of you who are worshiping with us online as well. It's great to have you here, too. Uh, there are just a few announcements that we want to start off with in uh, highlighting. If you uh, would like to uh, follow along in your bulletin, uh, just uh, draw your attention to the regular weekly meetings that happen, the prayer group on Wednesdays and the Zoom uh, men's coffee group on Thursday evenings. And um, uh, reminder that the HBC uh, uh, kids online that that is available every Tuesday for those of you who use those uh, videos and activities for your children uh, Also, we wanted to remind you that we have an October or sorry August service project going on Where we're collecting school supplies so things like pencils erasers scissors duo tanks and we're collecting those for uh, the kids at Moncton Head Start so we need you to bring your donations into the church before August the 20th. So that's a little later this week. So you see that some have started to collect here. If you don't have your school supplies with you and could drop them off at the church before the 20th, that would be wonderful. Also for young adults in our church, there is a beach trip that is coming up on August the 29th at one o'clock and they'll be going to Labuato Beach, which is, which is a beautiful spot. So if you're interested in that, or if you need a drive or more information, you can contact Pastor Cody on that. Um, also, we have a VBS, kind of a modified one that's going to be coming up, not this week, but next week. And it's called Boat, and it's going to be done uh, completely online. So there are some details in your bulletin for that, and it's possible for you to get instructions for materials that you will need from around the house for each session. You can get those in advance. Also, the youth are meeting this uh, Wednesday night uh, for a movie night here at the church. And the details are there in your bulletin and please bring a mask along for that event. Um, and also I wanted to mention the insert that's in your bulletin. Uh, it's exciting, we have a, a movie coming uh, up very soon at the Hub City Drive-In, which is where Solomon Gardens is off uh, Salisbury Road. Uh, the movie is Monday, August 31st with a rain date of uh, September the 1st. And if you're interested in joining, there are instructions in terms of how you can register online. I believe it's $10 a person or $25 a car load. And um, some of you may have uh, seen Jeremy Camp uh, perform live when he was here a few years ago. Well, this is the story of uh, his life and uh, about his relationship with his wife and it's called I Still Believe. Uh, here it's a really good movie. Um, in Psalm um, chapter uh, 95, it says for our call to worship this morning, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. And then jumping down to verse six, come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture the flock under his care. Shall we bow together this morning in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much as brothers and sisters in the Lord for the privilege of coming to your house this morning. Lord, we um, ask for your Holy Spirit to be present and we pray that he may guide and direct every aspect of our service through the, uh, the worship team, the prayers, and especially through your message that will be given by Pastor Cody later on. We pray, Lord, that each and every uh, thing that is thought and said and done this morning might be for your honor and for your glory, Lord. For it's in the name of our precious Savior, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to start with our first song, Shout to the Lord. We welcome God here. We worship him and we give him all the glory and all the praise. So will you stand with us for this first song, Shout to the Lord.
Thank you, worship team. I don't know about you, but it's hard to sing that song and not belt it out, right? It's really hard, and you almost you just you just can't help it. When you hit that chorus, it's perfect. So thank you, uh, worship team. Well, we're glad to see you this morning, and I just want to remind you, we're going to uh, offer a prayer for the offering here, and uh, just a reminder that you can drop off your offering at our church throughout the week during our normal office hours, or you can also send it in uh, through mail if it's not cash. Uh, you can also do it through online and push pay as well. So we just want to remind you about that, and thank you again for your continued offering. Well, let's pray as we uh, uh, come before the Lord and, uh, and thank him once again for all he's doing. Lord God... That song really exclaims our praise this morning. How great you are and how awesome you are. And Lord, we thank you for your many blessings that you give to us. Blessings that come in all shapes and forms and sizes. And Lord, we just thank you so much for each and every one of them. And we praise your name this morning for them. And Lord, this morning we offer to you now our gifts and our tithes. Just a small portion, Lord. For nothing can compare to what you have given to us. But Lord, we ask just the same that you use these to build your kingdom, Lord, and to reach into the hearts and minds of people who need to hear from you. Lord, be with us now as we continue to worship and praise your name. And we ask for all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We're going to continue to worship God this morning. He is our lamb, the roaring lion the Alpha and the Omega, and that's what this next song talks about. So will you stand for this next song, Behold Him.
says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. So we're gonna take a moment just now to be still before God. Close your eyes if you want to and just think of all that God is. Think of his greatness and his majesty in creation. As we were singing earlier, how great is he? Think of how the sun comes up every morning, his faithfulness to generation to generation, how his mercies are new every morning. Think of how he died and rose again for us. Think of his holiness, how his, his worthiness, he is deserving of all our praises. And if you believe that, we're going to sing this next song, and I hope you will sing it with all your heart.
that we would be a church in Moncton that is glorifying your name. And we give everything to you because you deserve all the glory. Amen. You may take a seat. Shall we pray together? Heavenly Father, indeed, how great you art. Father, you have blessed us in so many ways, too uh, many ways that we can't even start to count them. But first and foremost, we honor you this morning, for you are due all of our praise and all of the glory, Lord. We come before you, Father, this morning as sinners, for each and every one of us has fallen far short and has disappointed you as our heavenly father. We confess, confess our sins this morning, Lord, and humbly ask that you might be at work in our hearts. Help for us, Lord, to uh, more fully depend on you as we interact with others, as we go about our days. We pray, Lord, that you may help that our, our thoughts, our words, and our actions might bring you glory. Father, we um, come before you as well this morning, and we bring our church, Highfield, before you. Father, we thank you for how you have been faithful over these past months. In the midst of the pandemic and all the uncertainties that are going on in the world, we give you and you alone thanks. Father, at this time, we pray a special prayer for those who are in leadership roles, for the leaders in our church, for uh, municipal, for provincial, and federal leaders, Lord, that you might give them wisdom as uh, we brace for the potential of a second wave of the pandemic. We pray, Lord, that uh, you might give them wisdom to make decisions that would keep people safe and that would honor you. Lord, we think, too, of uh, the leaders of our church and um, ask that you might give our pastors and our board's wisdom as they make decisions for our ministries for the fall. Uh, we think of um, youth, the young adult ministries, uh, our small groups. We rejoice, Lord, that those have gone ahead and uh, that we have had unprecedented numbers uh, participating in the, those small groups over the past months. We thank you, too, that um, people here at Highfield have given so sacrificially and that we have been able to uh, meet our obligations financially above and beyond in the year 2020. Father, we think too of those who are not able to join us. We pray specifically for those who are joining us online and that this service, that in particular Cody's message might be a special blessing to each and every one of them, as well as those of us who are gathered here this morning. Father, we think of those who are shut in, for those who are sick in hospital, and we just pray, Father, for the comfort and strength of your presence at this time for each of these. Father, too, we um, continue to think of our uh, staff, our pastors here at Highfield. We um, pray in particular for Gary and Debbie. We ask for time of rest and relaxation for them as they vacation. We pray a special blessing upon um, Wes and Chantel, uh, Courtney and Derek and little Evelyn. And we pray in particular for Cody this morning, Lord, that you may give him uh, unusual license, that you may speak through him the message that you have given him and that it may enliven the spirit in each of our lives and um, inspire us, Lord, to live the life that you would have each of us live. We ask for these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Greg. Good morning. It's good to be with you once again and speaking with you. And uh, as, as Greg said, uh, Gary and Debbie are finishing up their vacation. This is their, their last day, and we hope they've had a restful vacation and that their last day serves them well. Our thoughts were with them throughout the week. I want to thank our AV team this morning, Matthew and Diana and uh, Renitha and Tommy and Dave Ford for helping up on the audio video and our worship team, of course, who always does a wonderful job up here and Greg sees for leading in, in, in prayer and Iris for the prelude this morning. We have a wonderful team who helped to make this possible. So thank you to each and every one of them. And welcome to our online folks as well. We're glad you're with us. Well, this morning I want to start with a question. Uh, 
and it kind of has something to do with what's up there. Uh, how many of you go boating in the summer? Anyone here go boating in the summer by a raise of hands? Okay, not, not a whole lot here. I, maybe, maybe those who go boating are out boating right now. <laughs> Could be a possibility. Uh, maybe some of you go kayaking instead or, or something like that. Maybe canoeing. Regardless, uh, it is a great summer activity, and, and it's a good way to get some exercise and some fresh air and some sun. And we have had lots of sun this summer, I would say. So that's definitely not a problem. In fact, boating is a great way to cool off. It's a really a fun activity, and you get to explore all the nooks and crannies uh, of our province. And you get to see some very awesome things. Unless, of course, you're these kids right here on this video. We're going to play that again one more time just because it's funny. Ah, oh, yes. Precious. <laughs> now, as you can see, they aren't really going anywhere fast. And that's because, though you can't see it, there is a hole in their kayak that needs to be patched up. And just a piece of advice, folks, if you do go boating, maybe check that there's no holes in the boat before you put it on the water, okay? Now, what's great about that clip we just saw is that the kids in the boat keep on paddling like there's nothing wrong. <laughs> like everything's all right and like they're going to make it. Maybe they didn't notice the hole with the water coming in and didn't see the problem. Well, this morning, we are going to talk about a group of people who, too, thought that they had everything going right as rain. But in fact, there were so many holes that they didn't even notice, and they were sinking without even realizing it. So let's turn this morning to Luke 11, verses 37 to 54. That's Luke chapter 11, verses 37 to 54. And the six woes to the Pharisees. I'd invite you to stand with me as we read from God's word this morning. Beginning at verse 37. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. And so we went in and he reclined at the table. But the Pharisees were surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. And then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made you the outside also make the inside? But now, as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of herbs, but you neglect justice and love for God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves which people walk over without knowing it. One of the experts in the law answered him, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. Jesus replied, And you experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Woe to you, because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your ancestors who killed them. So you testify that you approve of what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets, and you build their tombs. Because of this, God, in his wisdom, said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world. From the blood of Abel, to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. 
Woe to you experts in the law because you have taken away the key to knowledge you yourselves have not entered and you have hindered those who were entering. And when Jesus went outside, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Well, this morning, as we've read through Luke 11, 37 to 54, we hear of six woes that Jesus places on the Pharisees. This morning, the goal of the message is to sift through these six woes and what Jesus is saying to uncover some great truths and reminders about our very own faith walk. And when you actually break it down, what's interesting is the first three woes in this portion of Scripture provide us with a principle for us to learn. And the same applies to the last three, which provide another principle. But let's set this up first, shall we? As you may know, Jesus' ministry took him to many different places and, and many diverse groups of individuals. And following his speaking engagement here, one of the Pharisees presents uh, Jesus with an invitation to dine with him. It is not said or stated whether he gave Jesus the invitation as a mark of respect for him or maybe a, as an insidious design, perhaps to try to trap Jesus. We don't know what the, what the actual motivation was. It is quite possible that the Pharisee had a great deal of questions about Jesus' message and the law, and he wished to prove Jesus wrong, perhaps to prove that he is not who he said he was. Now, this is not the first time Jesus has been invited to the home of a Pharisee, nor was it the first time they had heard him teach. In fact, on several different occasions during his three-and-a-half-year ministry, the Pharisees had, of course, voiced their disapproval of Jesus and his teachings. Regardless of the intention of the Pharisees here, the dinner unfolds rather interestingly, because once they reach the house, that's when things begin to get a little bit heated. After accepting the invitation, he went along with the Pharisee and sat down at the table without washing, as all the other guests seem to have done. And I will say, there were other guests at this dinner. This is a ritual. This washing is a ritual that is expected of those who follow the law that these Pharisees enforce. Make no mistake, though, this Pharisee isn't upset that Jesus forget or forgot to wash the dirt off his hands before sitting down to eat. He's upset because Jesus didn't see the need to follow the tradition of the Pharisees and wash his hands in a certain way for a certain amount of time. Now, this type of ceremonial washing was not required by Jewish law, but was one of the traditions, as I said, the Pharisees had added to the law later on. Uh, you can see more about this in Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, verses 1 to 4. But author and minister William Barclay gives us a little insight into this religious practice. The law laid it down before a man that he must, uh, before he ate, he must wash his hands in a certain way, and that he must also wash them between courses. Large stone vessels, like the ones pictured in that, in that picture, uh, they were kept specifically for the purpose of washing because ordinary water might be unclean. The amount of water used must be approximately enough to fill one and a half eggshells. There you go. That's, that's a measurement right there. Use eggshells. The water must be poured over the hands beginning at the tips of the fingers and running all the way up to the wrist. Then the palm of each hand must be cleaned by rubbing the first of one into the other. And finally, water must again be poured over the hand, this time beginning at the wrist and running down to the fingertips. And to the Pharisee, to omit the slightest detail of this was to sin. Now that's a pretty particular way to wash your hands. Although for us today, we're pretty used to being very specific at how we wash our hands, aren't we? So you see, Jesus' rebuke of the Pharisees begins early in this chapter. But you must understand that they believed in the inspiration and authority of the Bible, in their case, the Old Testament. The Pharisees, who were originally laypersons seeking to avoid impure and immoral things, 
believed in the supernatural, in Satan, angels, heaven, and hell, and the resurrection of the dead. They believed in all that. But the problem with the Pharisees is not in what they believed, and in fact, not even in their noble goals, but it's in how they lost sight of their purpose and what they became as a result of it. They came to dwell too much and too heavily on the letter and not on the spirit of the law. They concentrated too much on the details of the law and not on its design or its purpose. Their traditions became priority number one and everything else took a back seat, though they didn't see it this way. And thus Jesus is calling out their hypocrisy. Their hypocrisy had stemmed from deep inside for they had lost the heart of their religion. And in verses 39 to 42, Jesus wants to make absolutely clear that he doesn't oppose their strict attention to religious duties or rituals, but he opposes their lack of care and compassion for they had lost that. And so this begins his list of six woes leveled against the Pharisees. And don't worry, each woe is not gonna take 10 minutes to get through. <laughs> I know, I, trust me, I like lunch just as much as you do. And so in these woes, their hypocritical issues will be brought to light in an effort to correct them. And likewise, we can learn from these woes as well. And so these first three woes will teach us one principle and the last three will teach us another. So let's take a look at the first accusation against the Pharisees in verse 42. And verse 42 reads, just to remind you, Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love for God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Now, what is Jesus saying here? Well, here, folks, he is referring to their lack of compassion. Now, picture this for a moment. This group of so-called law keepers and righteous leaders were huddled around a table, ensuring that each and every individual contributed just the right amount of herbs and other such items that were normally tithed. You can kind of picture them all huddled together, making sure and counting, making sure everything's uh, counted up properly. And put plainly, these Pharisees were more concerned with the amount of the tithe than with loving their neighbor. With this lack of compassion, they were depriving the poor of the spiritual food and drink needed to grow. Additionally, these Pharisees were tithing beloved possessions that they should have been sharing to those who were in need. Their focus on the fine points of the law caused them to miss the fundamentals of the teaching. They intentionally overlooked the part of the law that required them to have compassion on the poor and to love God with all their heart, soul, and mind. Now that's a pretty big accusation to start with, and it rings true today. Like the Pharisees, we sometimes fall into the trap, intentionally or not, of picking and choosing what parts of Scripture we might want to believe or, uh, or maybe adhere to. Or more prominently, we follow Jesus in obeying his commands for us when they don't inconvenience us. And sometimes we try to justify the disobeying of a very simple command in Scripture simply so that we don't have to abide by it. And this, folks, isn't how Jesus wants us to live. And it's the same for the Pharisees here. Their law and our Bible are not designed in such a way that we can pick apart and, and pick and choose what we wish to adhere to. The Bible is God's divine word to us, and we don't get to choose what we want to listen to or which uh, rules we want to follow. Imagine, for instance, a, a professor or a teacher gives a student a list of instructions to follow when writing an assignment or a paper. Now, imagine the student saying, well, I don't really have to follow all of the teacher's instructions. I'll just do half of what he said and not worry about the rest. Now, if the student did that, it would be unlikely that it would end well, right? Now, similarly, God has given us a book divinely designed not to bog us down in having a bunch of rules to follow, but in reality, to set us free 
and experience life as it is meant to be lived through obeying God and following him. The Pharisees missed this entire point. They were so hung up on following the rules, they missed out on the rest of the instructions and the purpose of the law in the first place. As one author I read wrote, uh, Jesus did not criticize the keeping of the law in its small points. He didn't criticize the tithing of mint, rue, and garden herbs, but he did say that the major thrust of the law, justice and love for God, must be fulfilled. And while both are important, the former, the fine points, are secondary. The latter is primary. That love for God, that justice, that lack of compassion was completely absent from their ministry. Which brings us to our second woe found in verse 43. See, I told you they wouldn't take 10 minutes each. And this one's a bit more straightforward. Verse 43 tells us, woe to you Pharisees because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace. You see, Jesus now moves on from criticizing their lack of compassion and love to critiquing their preoccupation with their reputation, the praise they receive, and ultimately their pridefulness. And I think that word summarizes this specific woe well, pridefulness. In short, these hypocritical men sought the praise of others rather than the praise of God and were driven mainly by their desire to have men's approval rather than God's. In all of their haughtiness and all of their vanity, they seem to forget the teachings of humility. And remember that Jesus himself came to earth not to seek popularity or gain favor among the people, but to save that which was precious to him, and in so doing face scorn and bitter hate and resentment. Let us not forget the words of Philippians 2.8 which says, and being found in appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Humbling oneself is how Jesus desires us to live and what he was accusing the Pharisees of lacking here with this woe due to their pride and eagerness to please others. And then we move on to the third woe located in verse 44. And it says, woe to you Pharisees, because you are like unmarked graves, which men walk over without knowing it. Now, it's important to understand the concept of uncleanliness in those days and the importance of a good and proper hand washing. And that's why we went over it. Uh, Numbers 19.16 explains it well. It says, anyone out in the open who touches someone who has been killed with a sword or someone who has died a natural death or anyone who touches a human bone or a grave will be unclean for seven days. You see, according to Jewish law, anyone who came into contact with a dead body or a grave was unclean. And so since the Pharisees were known to be committed to ceremonial and ritualistic washings, often being, doing that more than being compassionate to their neighbor, this image would have struck them as downright disturbing for they were being called unclean. But Jesus uses this simile to paint, the, Pharise- to paint the, the picture of what the Pharisees faced. As one commentator stated, though they have avoided touching a grave for fear of defilement, they themselves, through their own unrecognized corruption, were defiling those who came into contact with them. These righteous Pharisees thought of themselves as holy, and they saw themselves as the nation's only hope for being led to devout holiness. But Jesus tells them that the exact opposite was the case. They were themselves both unclean, sinful, and defiling to others. There was no blow more stunning to the Pharisees than this one so far. And the Pharisees' own corruption was making people unclean. Verse 44 concludes the first three of these six woes. Have you noticed a common theme throughout these first three? You see, whether it be the Pharisees' lack of compassion or love, 
their concern or for reputation or position, or the inner corruption and defilement that they were causing to other people. The lesson and the first principle is clear. The inside matters more than what is on the outside. Now I'm going to stop you, and I know that sounds like some corny line from a Hallmark movie. It certainly does, and no offense if you like Hallmark movies, that's great. But you see, the Pharisees were all about how things looked on the outside. Were things or people clean? Were there rituals being honored? And they overlooked the importance and priority of the heart. These Pharisees were hypocrites. And hypocrisy is kind of like the 12-year-old boy who was waiting for his first orthodontist appointment, and he was a bit nervous. Apparently, he wanted to impress the dentist. And on the patient questionnaire and the space marked hobbies, he had written, my hobbies are swimming, riding my bike, and flossing. <laughs> We're all prone to hypocrisy. But 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God's concern lies with the true condition of one's heart, not the outward appearance, as was the case with the Pharisees. And that gives us pause. For we need to stop and ask with this first principle, what is the state of our own hearts? That first principle is God cares more about the condition of your heart. Let me tell you folks, and I'll tell you bluntly, it's easy to play at being a Christ follower. It's easy to pretend to be one. It's easy to look like maybe you're following all the rules and commandments. It can be easy to dress up and go to church. It can be easy to come off as a perfect Christian when inside one may be anything but that. The truth is God's concern for your heart far outweighs any of the other stuff. He wants to know you and he wants you to be intimate with him, to be close to him, to truly live for him and not simply play at it. If this is you this morning and you find yourself maybe a little bit like the Pharisees, maybe unintentionally playing it, being holy or righteous, then maybe this comes as a wake-up call. And make no mistake, it's not my wake-up call to you, it's God's. I don't know the condition of your heart, I only know the condition of mine. But Dwight L. Moody said this, true character is what we are when nobody's looking in the secret chambers of the heart. To understand that the condition of your heart and of your faith is of the utmost importance to God. And he wants nothing more than for you to recognize that and respond to it by living the life he designed you to live through Christ Jesus, his son. So what is the state and condition of your heart, folks? And now we turn to verses 45 to 52. And the second set of three woes. Now this section interestingly begins with a statement from a seemingly offended expert of the law who claims that these Jesus, what, these, what Jesus had said, had insulted him. Now I want to make clear who these experts of the law are because it can be a little confusing actually what the interpretation is. Um, these last woes are directed at these experts, but once again, they have meaning for us. And these experts of the law were a subset, uh, uh, kind of a smaller group uh, within a larger group of Pharisees to whom Jesus was speaking. It's necessary to note that these experts were not lawyers, though. Okay? These were not lawyers. Rather, they were more like academics or theologians. As uh, uh, Bible.org puts it, uh, the Pharisees were the lay, if the Pharisees were the laymen of the group, committed to practicing and producing faithfulness, uh, but were failing at it, the experts in the law were the clergymen. And so these the so-called theologians and professors or academics, they were the source of these Pharisees' teachings and their belief system, really. And because of this, they could find ways to circumvent rules when they needed to for themselves. 
But Jesus responds clearly that they have some woes to share in the issues plaguing the Pharisees. I'm going to go through all three woes first here because these three share a lot in common and they produce that second important lesson that we can apply to ourselves. So our fourth woe and the first directed toward these clergymen is located in verse 46 when Jesus accuses them of loading people with burdens and then refusing to help carry them. Everything they taught resulted in further burdens on the people, not blessings. Throughout the Psalms, especially Psalm 119, David talks of the law as being a blessing, not a hindrance or a stressful form of worship. But the experts here, or I should say experts here, had turned it upside down, inside out, and perverted God's holy teaching. As a result, it was nigh impossible to adhere to the law, for it had become a complicated, hard-to-follow mess. One article I read online called the Pharisees' twisting of the law a miserable and unbearable code of conduct with no chance of properly following or obeying it. The law was not given to make men righteous, but to show men that they were unrighteous and serve as a signpost of sorts to point to the one who makes them righteous and offers redemption. Just to give you an idea of some of the twisting they managed to do, their law condemned murder or adultery, as, as they should, but they actually permitted hate and lust. That's because of some of the twisting and additions they had made to it. That produced confusion, as you can imagine, and caused both physical and spiritual burdens on the people who trusted these so-called experts in clergy. This teaching is really the opposite of what Jesus himself taught. The words of Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30 remind us when Jesus says, Come to me, and I will give you rest to your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. For the burdens now on their shoulders were anything but light. They were excruciatingly heavy and distorted. And that's why Jesus calls them hypocrites here. For they were making it harder on the people. Now let us proceed to woe number five. And this one's a bit longer, located in verses 47 to 51. It is the longest woe listed and perhaps the most layered as well. But it still has a point that correlates to what we're talking about here. Now, I'm not going to reread verses 47 to 51. If you have it, you can feel free. Uh, here, though, in verses 47 to 51, J Jesus basically condemns the Pharisees for building tombs to the prophets, though their fathers and ancestors killed them. And if they approved of these prophets' killings and murders, then they were logically directly opposed to God, the greatest prophet who had sent them. The Pharisees are following in the sinful steps of their forefathers. They're rejecting the message and the messengers sent from God. You see, we must not forget that the prophets were the ones who foretold of Jesus' coming and called on Israel to repent of their sins. But guess who did forget that? The Pharisees. That or they purposely ignored the significance of the prophets. They ignored the teachings and messages, which were, of course, direct messages from God. The law and prophets pointed to Jesus, and these clergy, who were supposedly these experts in scripture and theology, ignored these clear signposts directing people to Jesus' love and redemption. Either way, their generation would be held responsible, as verse 50 clearly states. The prophets pointed people to God, and the Pharisees rejected all of it. And Jesus says that they will now pay for all of it because they had come to despise the Son of God. Their generation was just as guilty as the generations before who were responsible in spilling the blood of the prophets. And finally, verse 52 contains the last woe directed toward the Pharisees. Jesus says the Pharisees took away the key to knowledge and hindered those who were entering. What is the key to knowledge? The Bible talks a lot about keys, in fact. 
Here, the key to knowledge is implied to be the divine revelation of the scriptures. They were hindering people from knowing and responding to God's word, to his truth. So these Pharisees weren't just bringing harm to the people physically in their lack of compassion and not helping out the needy. They were bringing, once again, harm to them spiritually by purposefully concealing the truth. What is the goal of Scripture but to point us toward God? It's implied that the knowledge here is the kingdom of God that people were interested in learning about how to enter. How do we get into that kingdom? But the Pharisees have become almost exclusive in their concealing of these truths and the sharing of the knowledge with them. They were hindering people from responding to God. See, Jesus used the key of knowledge, understanding the nature and will of God to bring them to him. And with this concealed, uh, this concealed knowledge and it being held exclusively back from the people, they were lost and they were confused. They weren't pointing people to a way of life, but pushing people from it. Now, I wonder if maybe we do that sometimes too, intentionally or not. See, these last three woes were of great importance to Jesus, and he wanted to make that clear. A.W. Tozer said this of the group, The Pharisees are hard on others and easy on themselves, but a spiritual man is easy on others and hard on himself. It's really a great quote that sums up the Pharisees' biggest issues, that there was nothing really wrong with them, that it was everyone else who who wasn't a Pharisee that had the greatest of problems. But God wants us to check ourselves in the mirror and ask what we're doing to point people toward God. And that leads us to our second principle. Because of their hypocrisy and exclusivity, because of their burdening of others and rejection of certain foundational teachings, they had misled those who trusted them and turned them away from God. As we stated earlier, in their rejection of certain teachings, they missed the entire purpose of our lives as Christians, as Christ followers. Colossians 3.17 commands, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. And 1 John 3, 18 adds to this, little children, let us not love in walk, or sorry, in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. And that truth, our second principle, is that we need to be signposts for Jesus Christ, pointing people toward him, not detracting from him. Scripture does this. The prophets did this. The law was designed for this, and we are created for this. Years ago, how many of you uh, remember Britain's King George V? Anybody? (laughs) Well, years ago, uh, he was going to be giving an opening address at a special conference with the speech relayed by radio to the U.S., and as the broadcast was about to begin, a cable broke in the radio station. And more than a million listeners were left without sound. A junior mechanic in the station, his name was Harold Vivian. He solved the problem, though. He picked up both ends of the cable and allowed 250 volts of electricity to pass through him. He was the living link that allowed the king's message to get through. In your own life, then, folks, Are people receiving the message of the heavenly king through your life? Folks, in everything you do, are you pointing people to Jesus or are you leading them astray? Now, you may be leading people away from God unintentionally, but it is worth examining this to determine the answer. The Pharisees were misleading people and in so doing, they were turning them from God, whether through their poor teaching, excessive burdens or stipulations and rejection of certain important elements of scripture. And combined with the failure to examine their own hearts, is no wonder Jesus lays into them for their faults so intensely and so bluntly here in Luke 11. But we can fall into the same trap as the Pharisees. Author J.D. Greer said that Phariseeism, which is the values and the attitudes of the Pharisees, is a poisonous weed that grows in every garden of orthodox religion. 
Phariseeism is every bit the threat that it was then and it is today. And so ask yourself, is it growing inside of you? In your walk of faith day by day, week by week, year by year, are you pointing people toward the Son of God who offers salvation freely out of love? Or will you respond like the Pharisees do in verse 54 by firing a barrage of insults and questions at Jesus, intent on opposing him to the last breath? I'd like to invite the worship team forward this morning as we conclude You know, I titled this message, Woe Your Boat, (laughs) partly because I like a good pun, but because we all really are in the same boat. Phariseeism is a real thing because many of these sins, as I said, that plague the Pharisees pop up in our lives now. And Jesus is calling out our woes and our sins so that we may live a life more pleasing to him. He wants us to throw these things overboard to help rescue those who may be struggling in the water. And my prayer today for each of you is to let the Spirit of God, working through the Word of God, expose our inward sins so that we can face them and overcome them. May each of us seek God from the heart to have a a pure heart by His grace and for His glory. And may we boldly confront our woeful sins by seeking forgiveness and asking him to cleanse us in order to better point people in the direction of Christ Jesus. Folks, don't be like the Pharisees. Don't let your woes sink your boat. As we respond to Cody's message, we're going to sing the beautiful hymn, Cleanse Me. And just think of the first line, Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior, and know my thoughts, I pray. So will you stand and join us for this final hymn?
Thank you, worship team. Folks, may that be the prayer on our hearts today as we close this morning. Let's pray together. Father, cleanse us. Speak to us today. And as we leave this place, Lord, we ask that you help us to walk in such a way that reflects who you are so that others can see you through us. Lord, help us to avoid being like the Pharisees and rather, Lord, let us examine the condition of our hearts and remind ourselves, Father, that it is through you that we become pure and that we experience love and compassion and forgiveness. Go with us now as we leave this place, Lord. Help us to walk by your strength and in your light. And we pray for all of these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you next week.